Good evening. Welcome to another D-Day event. My name is Andrea Bauer. This is Boris Moschkowitz. We are the initiators of D-Day. And uh, tonight we talk about art. And since we talk about art, I am very proud to announce a uh, collaboration, a partnership with uh, the Arts Plus. Uh, you probably saw these envelopes which are lying on your, uh, on your chairs. This is an invitation actually from the Arts Plus for the Arts Plus conference, which is taking place on the 19th of October with the, um, uh, with the, with the um, uh, Buchmesse in Frankfurt. And um, yeah, and as a member of uh, the D-Day network, as you are, you get up to 60% of the regular tickets. So check out the website. I think it's an amazing lineup and uh, I'm gonna be there, we're gonna be there. So maybe we see each other there. So back, um, we are talking about art and I'm super excited about talking about discussing this topic because every time when I approached or pitched the next topic for D-Day, what I get as a first feedback was a, bit, a long pause, actually, when I said we talk about blockchain and art. And um, which was the best proof, actually, you know, that these two planets, that we really talk about two planets, the tech world and the art world, and it's time really to interlink them and to discuss, actually, the digital shift and development, what's going on in the art world and, uh, yeah, how is the creative process is changing through technology or also virtual experience are really uh, coming up and also the distribution and the broadcasting of art is uh, changing. And I think we got two amazing pioneers in this area, um, Elizabeth from uh, EcoloTV and Marsha from Ascribe or Big Chain DB. And uh, yeah, and the background and their exciting uh, yeah, background, Boris is gonna introduce them, thank you. Sure, um, we're really happy to have those both. As uh, uh, Andrea said, there's uh, two worlds uh, colliding and this is what we call it the brave new art world. Um, there's definitely change about to happen and uh, Elizabeth Markovich is a veteran in the best sense of the word of the art world. She survived many things and many incarnations she's gone through. She uh, worked as, a, she founded the art division for Schroeder Bank, she was at Sotheby's, she did a lot of exhibitions, consultant to many companies and uh, what uh, we invited her for though is that she started pioneering the digitization of the art world when she started Econo TV and she'll tell us more about that later because uh, she's not only doing that uh, for television, internet and 3D but uh, she's also looking in the future and um, she's a great partner to talk to and we have Masha McConaughey who on the other side comes uh, it seems more from a technical side with a uh, big chain DB, uh, uh, a blockchain database company, and Ascribe.io, which also belongs to her and was started with, by her husband Trent and her. And um, at the same time, she holds degrees from uh, Sorbonne and the Louvre in the arts and museum degrees. Um, and she is at the crossroads of uh, commerce, art, technology, and this is what we want to today delve into and discuss with the two of them. So please come to the stage and welcome Masha and Elizabeth. Welcome. Yeah, thanks again for being here. And uh, as Boris just said, Marsha, you, you founded this company. Not just, uh, so first of all, BlockchainDB, this is actually the name of the, of the company. Big Chain DB, sorry. And Ascribe is just an example. It's uh, an application. An application on, on top of blockchain. Right. And so maybe you can give a little bit a uh, description how you come up with the idea and also a kind of a description of what blockchain actually is because the term is not that, that yeah, widespread, I would say. Sure. Um, thank you very much for such a beautiful presentation and thank you very much for coming uh, here. Um, yeah, so just um, quick, my quick explanation uh, about blockchain is basically think about it as spreadsheet in the sky that no one owns no one controls, you can only write to it, you can never delete from it, and the record's there forever. That's forever, ever. Forever, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means, <laughs> right? Like, because it's a like, 
Bitcoin blockchain, I think um, there might be some experts here in the audience. I think it's the record is for 120 years, but then you can export it to something else. But let's not get into the discussion what's forever. <laughs> um, that's basically the notion of uh, blockchain. And it was um, first um, application on the blockchain was Bitcoin, the e-cash. And um, kind of why, why it was revolutionary is because all the attempts before uh, of digital e-money uh, were failing because it was all registered, all the transactions were registered on the centralized spreadsheet. And when the company goes broke or you can tamper the records, people lost their money. And where the revolution came is that blockchain that is, um, there is no centralized control over, uh, yeah, there is no centralized control over that spreadsheet. So it's all decentralized, right? And what is actually then, what problem does a scribe then solve for the art world? Yeah, so we started the idea about three years ago and kind of the question that we started to ask ourselves was um, how do you collect digital art? And because uh, me and my partner, we travel a lot and um, we know a lot of artists, a lot of artists do work uh, with digital tools. So um, we're like, how, how can you own it, right? And when I run a gallery in Canada, like the most digital that collectors would ever go was like digital print. Mm -hmm. And when I asked them, why wouldn't you collect video, let's say, or something, there's like, I don't know how, like, what do I own? Is it yeah. like just a cassette or like, what exactly am I owning? Um, so we were just talking about it um, and then Trent was uh, very involved in uh, the tech world and following Bitcoins when it started and he was fascinated about technology and we came up like, why wouldn't you own digital art the way you own Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a very good match mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end. Yeah, so this is how it's all started. Right. Yeah. Now that we're looking, let's say, in the, in the origins of your passions and companies, I want to ask Elizabeth, well, basically, you come from a very traditional art background, and in the first um, positions that you uh, were responsible for, the Sotheby's and, and the, the bank, uh, you were dealing with the traditional mechanisms. What made you shift to Econo? How did this come about? What was uh, the reasoning behind starting Econo TV? In fact, um, um, in 97, I came up with another idea, and I, um, I was obsessed because up to 97, I was expert in, in art, impressionist art and modern art, and working for these big companies. And I was, so to say, in this very elite world. And there was a moment where I was asking myself, how can we share, or I could I share my passion for the arts? Because I was still very market orientated, um, I came up with this idea, how can, before sharing, how can other people buy a work of art from a famous artist, but wouldn't necessarily have the money to afford it. And this is where I, I built with two friends, iStorm. iStorm.com was in fact the first ever gallery online in 98. And so we've been a kind of dinosaur already of the digital age, so to say, because we could have never done what we've done without digital, because what we did ask the artist, we asked very famous artists, by giving us a digital file. Mm -hmm. And with the digital file, we were using um, a, a very nice medium with a photography paper, and just reproducing on the photography paper because we wanted people to have something which would be nice to have. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is how it started. But then, funny enough, even though we were on the internet, there was only people in London and New York buying it. So we were on internet, why? And so it took me years. You don't have these ideas like this. Well, I don't have these ideas like this. So then came the idea, so if you compare it systematically to the music industry, mm -hmm. basically iStorm did the record because it was a product. A, pro a, a record is a product, product, and this product is worth the same money, whatever, you know, it's done by a famous artist or not. And the, he or she never controls, 
you know, the distribution, who is, you know, who is buying it, who are their fans, and they meet them only in the real world, mm -hmm. so to say, when they come to the concert. So this is how I thought, okay, if you want to buy a record today, the only, one to, the only way to discover this record is in fact to discover it in a, either in a public space, in a bar, or on the radio. So basically, Icono is the answer to the radio. It's trying to bring art to everybody's home, to give a first experience to the arts, and to build up this little bridge, which is, I have no clue about art, I'm not even interested because this is for somebody else. And I think the main idea behind is that um, the art world has this tendency to talk too much and to intellectualize everything before even we need it. I'm not saying we don't need it. I'm just saying we do it too quickly and too much. And we overwhelm probably somebody who has no idea, who hears words that you know, doesn't talk to them. So what were, I mean, as the radio had a lot of resistance uh, from the music industry in its uh, early days, uh, I imagine you had a lot of resistance. And where was that coming from, rather from the artists themselves or the surrounding? And uh, how, what were the first challenges? I would challenges? say everybody. Uh, to be very fair, I would say that everybody, nobody really understood. You know, I started Icono itself. I was saying iStorm in 98. Icono, it's 10 years now. Um, it took me five, six years to just knock at the door of everybody, to knock at the door of artists, to knock at the door of museums. I'm still doing it. It's my main job to, to do that. Um, and the word digital was already something. You know, when I started the idea in 2005, that's the idea that YouTube came start. You know, we have the feeling YouTube always exists. It's only 2005. And that's exactly the same moment where I have it. And what I basically am going now, it's going to to do this, you know, to do this kind of... Uh... Right, maybe you can explain in two sentences what Icono does for all of those who are not familiar with the, the program and the product. So if I take another example of music um, to make it maybe visualize, if you don't look at it now, um, is basically we have a stream which lasts continuously. A video stream. A video stream. And um, it is, some people call it the MTV of the arts, but the MTV of the 80s, not the MTV of today. And what was interesting with the MTV when it started, which was a real revolution for, for me, I was pregnant from my first child who is in the room, and um, it was a, a shock because at the time we were having, what, three public TV stations, and mm -hmm. suddenly MTV arrives. So you can imagine that uh, it is a shock. But MTV did something fantastic, because it was, they invented what we call today a video clip. And the video clip is the marriage between a musician and a filmmaker doing a third work of art. True. And so we do exactly the same. Yeah. I have art historians, artists, curators, whoever know about the work of art. And what I ask them is to, in fact, tell the story of the work to the filmmaker, not to you and me, to only the filmmaker. And the filmmaker tried to, in fact, translate this story purely visually. So what you see today is, in fact, moving images on a single work, but what goes very slow, we give you time, so to say, and we give you uh, the possibility to just contemplate a work of art and we discover or discover a specific detail, the technique in, in all these things. And we tell you the story visually. And I think it's, it's also interesting for the audience, you know, how you two interlink in the end. Because as you say, you were knocking on a lot of doors, talking, uh, you know, um, with a lot of artists to persuade them, to give them you, uh, their, 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 uh, the pieces to you, the art pieces to you, to, to use them for Icono to file, which were, of <coughs> course, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, yeah, convincing and building up trust. And I think this was a main issue in the beginning, right? It is a lot about trust, not necessarily trust about how we were going to do Especially the job. the digital world. I but mean, it's yeah. the digital world. Right. It's yeah. true that it's the digital world which f make people very uh, afraid, um, which was for me never a problem because you can put on, uh, on internet so low resolution images that at the end, what do you want to do with it? Yeah. And, um, and this is the problem. And then when you give, you know, analog parallels, they said, of course, you know, I remember an artist one day told me about 15 years ago 
that he had a guy from Japan coming to his studio with a new book about his work. The guy did photos of the work everywhere. He didn't ask him anything. Mm -hmm. So basically he did steal everything, did it all that. And half of the book, I think, was even kind of scanning from, an other, book, from other books. So that's, nobody thinks about that. But the digital, the open source, as soon as you, would you say pronounce <laughs> the word digital, everybody says, no way, I don't want, I want to protect my, you know, my things. Yeah, it kind of scares people, right? Because they have this no, like, sense of losing control as soon as you say the word digital or internet, right? Because everything you put in the internet, it only goes forward, and you can't really catch it. Like, where's this link between the file and the creator? Like, how many images we have on the internet that we have no idea who created them, right? And um, and that's this, especially with the artists, because the, it's 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 a normal um, thing that like you are losing control over it, yeah. right? And um, I wanted to say that Elizabeth, not only uh, like I think to add to what you are doing on Econo, I think Elizabeth is also like looking forward. She's probably the first person I met who, when I talked about blockchain and um, the technology, she was like, yeah, that makes sense. The, right, for, Especially for you, yeah. But right. it was yeah. making yeah. sense, it's, not necessarily uh, for me, yeah. um, because I don't need that, mm -hmm. personally, in my work. You mm -hmm. know, I, I really don't need them. But the artists or the museums or whoever we're working with need them. Mm -hmm. And then we go, so I encourage them yeah. which makes my life complicated, meaning not only I have to explain what I do, but now I have to explain what they do. So I yeah. can tell you that it's not easy. Um, it became more complicated. I, I still don't understand what is a Bitcoin, so yeah. you see. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's, it's really this, uh, this thing where you have to, to, to make them feel comfortable yeah. and tell them, you go through them, it's there, it's yours, yeah. it's on the platform that with a, you know, a site you control, and you're just giving me the okay that I can stream it. Mm. I mean, I mean that's like it. usage rights. Yeah, right? and I mean talking about a scribe, you know, it's it's kind of it's a it's a platform who tries to more in a sustainable way manage ownership. And so it's about provenance. It's about maybe yeah. you can describe a little bit. You know, what can you actually do? Mm. Sure, on a sure, scribe? sure. So the blockchain technology, where the kind of the whole um, thing is about, is blockchain is perfect for tracing provenance, mm -hmm. right? Because you have this record from where it, this file came and where it goes. Mm -hmm. And it's very clean ownership mm -hmm. lineage, right? Mm -hmm. Ownership, um, um, provenance. So, um, so think about it that blockchain is like a time stamping mechanism, mm -hmm. right? So you first, as an author, you time stamp your claim of authorship. Right? And ideally, you do it at the point of creation. Mm -hmm. Then you always have this uh, proof that you had access to that file at that point of time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, then what you can do that's where, like, because just time stamping, like, there's a lot of companies that do time stamping, where, like, uh, with Ascribe, what we did, we actually built in very standard licensing, mm -hmm. very standard contracts, mm -hmm. that you're transferring certain usage rights mm -hmm. to another person, right? right? Mm -hmm. And for us, this is where it uh, was important. Yes, like with digital, you might be scared to put your files on the internet, but at the same time, a lot of artists, they do want to spread their work online. They want for, uh, others to see the work online. At the same time, they want to monetize. And this is where kind of this difference between title and copies access right. and title, yeah. right? Yeah. So you can have only, and this is where blockchain helps you with a title because you can secure that specific, that, let's take a very specific example of video, right? Mm -hmm. Like you are the creator of video art, uh, you timestamp on the blockchain your claim of authorship, you mm -hmm. can create unique editions, let's mm -hmm. say five, and then you transfer that specific edition mm -hmm. to, let's say, Elizabeth. So mm -hmm. you transfer rights of that edition, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, you are a very open artist and Which you is, want to also spread your video around the world, yeah. right? Because that's what also in the digital world is kind of this new proxy for value. Right. Like more yeah. people see it, more value it comes. Like this whole digital shift in terms of the, yeah. uh, right? Like it's not only because nobody sees it in your kitchen behind the, 
uh, I don't know, curtain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why like, it's so valuable. In the digital world, things are shifting, right? And like some artists, they pray, uh, prize their work based on how many views you had. Um, so, where was I? <laughs> well, so, but basically, you're, crea you're creating a mechanism, if you say, to manage, to distribute, and in a way, as you managed uh, a gallery in, in, in Vancouver and, and now creating this platform, are there similarities? Are, is that becoming some sort of gallery system itself? Can it enable? And if, then how? So, we never wanted to be the front end, right? Like we are always like think about uh, Ascribe and Big Chain DB. We're really focused on technology, and we're really focused. We're like a plumbing, right? Think about that. Uh, PayPal is a um, processor of a payment processor by email. Think about um, Ascribe as a, um, a digital rights processor by email, right? So, and this is where um, we want to power the front ends, the user experience like Elizabeth uh, platform, for example, this is where, like she is the face towards the consumer. She has her very own mission uh, to uh, deliver to the consumer and to the public in general. So we are actually not very visible, we are on the, lower level of technology, right? So, but basically, it, it can become a marketplace in itself if somebody you decides build, to build yeah, a front you, yeah, on Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, and we had that. Like, uh, for example, we had, and f funny enough that uh, you're mentioning it now, uh, so we had one 19-year-old um, contacted us by email saying, I'm going to do a marketplace for digital goods and I need an ownership processor of the rights. I was like, okay, how long you're going to build it? Because we talked to another place that's been building for a year already, a marketplace. I was like, okay, uh, I'll use a Shopify as a front end, so like one week, then I'll just integrate you on the back end. I'm done in two weeks. <laughs> We're like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, marketplace in two weeks. And this is what amazing with digital tools is that like, it allows you to experiment with things, right? It allows you to, mm -hmm try new things and see what works, what doesn't work, and so on, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so we are basically powering other marketplaces, right? Like, recently, actually, there was uh, another marketplace that came out uh, called Luminous. Uh, so Luminous, um, Lumen Art, Digital Art Prize uh, in UK, they're uh, quite um, important art prize. Uh, for digital arts uh, specifically. So they wanted to help their artists. They said, like, we receive so many uh, wonderful artist applications and we want to make sure, like, we want to help them to monetize somehow. And what do we do? So they just opened a new marketplace where you can just buy digital edition from their uh, artists. Mm -hmm. And so, are because, like, you have a lot of people who want to help artists to monetize, right? And you just need different tools and different places to put them together and build something wonderful. I mean, it's exciting to hear at what um, speed things are changing when you talk about it. Elizabeth, when you talk to museums, when you go to the art fairs, when you talk to galleries, um, what is your experience in, in, in the change and the willingness to change and at the same time, uh, the need to change. So what sort of ecosystem do you see in the future and what role will you possibly play in that? Well, the thing is that the museums are still very slow and specifically I would say European museums. Um, they are, the, they are the, the slowest and they're still not even there. They think they're super modern with just a website. And, um, and, the, and the guys who have a website, you even look and you see that they didn't digitize yet the collection. So they're really, really far behind. Um, in America, um, what I'm doing seems so natural, even it doesn't exist, but when I talk to them, they say, oh yeah, we see immediately what you want. The thing is that she's talking about marketplace. We did come up with another marketplace because we just launched two, three weeks ago, our on-demand section. And the on-demand section is going to be, you know, a kind of uh, like you see in the music industry, also, you know, where you, you would always have the freemium, but the on-demand will be 
a premium, so to say, where you will have a monthly subscription base. And here, in, instead of selling art, you're going to, in fact, we will be able to pay royalties and a licensing to the, you know, to the artist. So, because we will always be streaming. Through us, you will never own a work of art. But through a scribe, we, they sign a contract with us, which is on a scribe, and they agree that, in fact, we can stream, they can limit it in a time, they can say it's okay for one year, two years, or whatever, and then um, we, we just stream it, and we will, then they will have a revenue share from this subscription fee. I think it's interesting, you know, because you say marketplace now, you could also say virtual gallery. I'm just wondering, you know, how the notion of a gallery is kind of changing through this new... I don't think the gallery version. needs the digital world to change. It's changing on its own. The, the gallery system is, is slowly going to disappear anyhow, and it doesn't need the digital for that. I don't think it's the digital. I think it's mainly the artist needs. Artists are, are need bed, bigger space. Mm -hmm. they, want, they don't want to always um, exhibit in the same space. You know, when you, you have to realize that when you're a gallery, you're, you're asking, in fact, an artist to fit your space. Always the white cube. Th yeah. yeah, but mm -hmm. a white cube or whatever, mm -hmm. it is a space. Mm -hmm. So you give them a restriction, a framework, which is already limited. Well, if you are a gallerist, you should do the opposite. You should say, what kind of space do you need for that work? Mm -hmm. And you should be looking for the space. So the problem is that we know that every seven years, and as an average, a gallery should move, because after two exhibitions, solo exhibition to an artist, the third time, you know, the artist is fed up, and this is why they lose their artist, okay. and they go to other galleries mm -hmm. with bigger space or whatever, and they also leave these bigger space. It's always a moment where the, there is a frustration in the, for yeah. the artist. So I don't think the digital is responsible here. We put yeah. everything on the back of digital, but in this case, I don't think. That's why I think that the galleries have to rethink the way they work. So there's a kind of a liberation is taking place, in, also in the, in the characteristic of an artist through new technology? Or how would you see that? You know, regarding the identity of an artist and how you say, you know, the artist is kind of, you know, adapting to the space which is in the gallery or in the museum or wherever. Um, but then, you know, when you say, okay, you can use whatever space and I exhibit it, you in a virtual space, so what is happening then to the identity of the artist and how he expresses him or herself? I don't think it changed. Because it then you become bigger. The, the only thing which is changing in, you, in what you're saying is the ownership. Right. It's about ownership. But do we need to own a work? to look at it, yeah. you know, uh, that's, that's the question, is that we are in a world where we're just always talking about selling and buying, mm -hmm. but uh, what I'm doing is not about selling and buying, it's to give uh, first access to art, mm -hmm. and then with other tools, like what we're doing now with the 3D and all this, we're giving, a, we're giving another type of experience, but it will never kill the real experience, mm -hmm. it's just complementary, it can be the bridge, it can have a lot of different levels, yeah. but it's not either or. You know, I always, I'm sorry if I come back to the music industry, but I think we all know it by heart and we know how it works and, and it talks to, to everybody. But in the music industry, you basically have three types of experience, or four if you add radio, but let's say tomorrow it's my birthday, and I want to do a big party and invite you for my party, and I ask Daniel Bauenboim to come and play to my, on my grand piano, or Madonna, or whatever, I'm going to pay how many hundreds of thousands to have them at home? But it's my problem. It's yeah. what I do with my money, and I decide to offer myself this, mm -hmm. and to my friends, and we're going to be 15 or 20, enjoying an amazing evening with an amazing musician. Now, you could say, you're ridiculous, you live in Berlin, why don't you just go to the opera? Barenboim is there every day, you know, and so on. Yeah. Or, I go and buy a CD. Yeah. You know, these are three things that we can all do. And or you turn on Spotify. Or you turn on Spotify, but it's just, I'm Voila, just saying is that you, you, no, no, nothing is, uh, it's not either or. We can do all of them. And so I think in the art, it's the same. There's no reason to be only a collector and not look at that something else or only, you know, it's... And I think it's about experience first. Mm. You know, Duchamp, 
we always refer to Duchamp. Mm -hmm. He had a wonderful sentence that he did in a manifesto, I think, in the early 50s, which was to say, there is no work of art if there is not a viewer. Which is true. If you are alone in your bathroom with your work, you're alone with your bathroom and your work. You know, nobody will see it, and then your work doesn't exist. So the digital is giving you a first life, and then we will go to the real thing, you know, or it's complementary, but it's, it's not going to kill it. It's going to make it live and live, and the more it's seen, the more it lives. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, when we're talking about art, there's always the notion of scarcity, excess. Being able to own or see that work in a limited circle was, uh, was part of that experience and that might be changing and we even see when we talk about marketplace now that the eBay, Amazon are creating art platforms, Gagosian has a click and buy button. We see the, the say the mainstreaming of the art industry. They are um, not inventing anything here, I'm sorry, they are just... Um, using a technology to allow you to buy something quicker. But what does it mean to the to arts? That. What does it mean to the quality of the arts? If let's say art is defined by review, and I used to work uh, for a publication, Flash Art, and it was always about uh, who said what about which work, which also co-defined um, the worth of the work, and also to what collection it would go, who buys it, and what collection is it hanging as part of that whole process. The biennials, uh, these are all, let's say, part of the worth and value creation of art. Now we have these platforms, and um, how will or how can a scribe, for example, um, accommodate these reviews, these uh, value processes? So just coming back a bit about the galleries, I actually don't think they will disappear. I think they're shifting and then like um, their role is shifting as well. Uh, but there is always this like human aspect, right? Like collectors, some collectors, there is also different types of collectors, but some collectors, they like to kind of belong to this club a certain club or the gallery experience or galleries organize uh, different uh, events and get you like into a different experience. They create experience for you. Um, also, the most important is actually a curatorial aspect, especially in this age where we have so much content. Um, there is a need like of more curation of that content, like the, the, the whole kind of Curator is a, um, 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 how do you call it, um, a, a, as, a, as a work, um, as a profession, right? Curator, uh, basically, like in this modern type of curator, it's only the phenomenon of the, like, let's say, mid 20th century, right? Like the modern type. Uh, probably the Magicien de la Terre, that was mm -hmm. the first exhibition with uh, where like this. And that was in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, right? So um, I think that galleries take big role of curation as well on themselves because a lot of people, like, they don't know what to get, so they will go to the gallery. It's like you're going to the different types of stores, right? Like, you like that type of clothing, you go to that store. Um, so I think just the, in terms of galleries, it's just shifting their role and definitely they're adapting and also educational parts, like um, there's still this educational part to educate your collectors uh, and um, at the same time also the good galleries, they also develop the career of the artist as well and help them grow and so on. Um, yeah, so this is one kind of thing that I wanted to kind of um, to say my opinion on it. Um, where also like with Econo, right? Like you curate a lot of content. Oh, everything is curated. Mm -hmm. And it's, right? a, it's like again on the radio, you, you, you curate your playlist. Mm -hmm. But That's again, this create. is part of, of, of the process of uh, creating value. As I said, the, the curators as the gatekeepers to exhibitions, to galleries, to museums, exactly. to biennials, exactly. and, um, and critics as those voices who validate art. How, how will that play out in, in the digital world? So with technology, like, uh, for example, with blockchain technology, um, so the, like going back to the regular uh, art market, uh, authenticity and chain of ownership. That's 
what brings the value up of the artwork, right? So with the blockchain technology, what you can do is, um, let's say we're talking about um, not even digital, regular art market, right? And there is, a, um, let's say, a Van Gogh. And one expert says it's a Van Gogh, the other expert says it's not, and then, um, but what blockchain technology enables is actually um, timestamp all those claims together in one place. So every time one expert says or gives a report, you always attach it to that artwork. And this is like this whole um, archive of the different expertises. Mm -hmm. Because what happens in the art world, and you worked in the uh, auction houses, right? Like this expert said something, it's got lost. This expert said, and then it gets re-expertized each time, and so on. But if you have this basically archive of knowledge and that somebody said that's already valuable, and then for sure for the future is each time that ownership is transferred, you have this clean provenance, right? So think about technology as a mechanism to help address a certain problem, right? It's not a magic pill. It's not going to say is it real or not, but it can certify or um, basically timestamp some of the claims. I'll give you another practical thing for artists. I think the, one of the best artists who did a fantastic job during his lifetime to organize his work was Paul Klee. Mm -hmm. Paul Klee was maybe the only artist who basically did put a number on every single work mm -hmm. and build up during his lifetime his catalogue raisonné. Basically, you could, everything was done. Everything was, you know, you knew when he did that, what was the number, he gave an archive number, which is everything what, you know, a scribe does. It gives you the number and gives all these things. Um, and, and it makes the life of the artist easier because when, once it's done, it does it once. How many times we've been asking an artist, can you send us this? And they said, oh, well, I already did send it, or I've done it, uh, it's on my Vimeo, or it's on whatever. And they did put all the info. So they always have to repeat everything, which means that they repeat also the errors. Mm -hmm. While if they do it only once on the work, then they just say, okay, Elizabeth can have it, you can have it, mm -hmm. and they have a trace of everything they've done, but the metadata of the work is done only once. And this is fantastic for the artist that they don't, you know, it's there, they can correct it, of course, they can change it if they want to add it or whatever, but it's completely under their control and they know that people will download this metadata, meaning in my catalog that I will write on this artist, I'm not going to repeat always the same mistake, which is something which happens all the time. What I thought it was interesting because, of course, I went on a scribe and I uh, also um, signed up as an artist. And so I set up an account and I uploaded a picture, an animated GIF, which was just on my computer, but of course I didn't create it. And so uh, now I'm on the Scribe blockchain, certified as the creator of this animated GIF, which I never did. I try, and then in the terms and condition I read, so what is once on this blockchain will, is not deletable. This is why I said never, never, ever, ever. And so I was just wondering, so how do you prove or how can you say that really the, the, earn, the, the, the person who uploads the digital art piece is really the creator? And uh, yeah. So we are a tool. So, right, like we don't check that you are the creator. You, uh, in, like we say, you have to be the rights holder to register. And if you are not, you're committing a fraud. And in the court of law, <laughs> if, Oops. right, like, that's why, like, first, it's important that, like, ideally, people do it at the point of creation. And then if somebody registers their work, you have the proof you created, you had access to that file first, right? right? So think about it as a proof, right? It, you're time stamping. Yeah. Because some, some people would also register on behalf of the artist, right? They will put artist name and mm -hmm. so on, right? Like, um, but yeah, like it's, a, if, if it goes to the court of law, like, and if you committed a, cro a fraud, like, 
Mm -hmm. You time stamped it. Like me. <laughs> yeah, you know, we can do all tests. You can actually delete it, and then the deletion will be also in the blockchain. Yeah. But um, yeah, like we can play yeah. around, right? But if you want to transfer the rights, yeah. and then somebody says you are not the rights holder, yeah. and they can prove it, then they can take you to court. <laughs> I see. That's why, like, technology is not replacing the yeah. ecosystem. The courts are still working, right? It's it just, just brings print. you an evidence. Mm -hmm. And, like, when I talk to several lawyers, especially, like, copyright lawyers, mm -hmm. it's, for them it's a fantastic tool, right? I was just wondering, because uh, it, when we talk about the production of art, for instance, and, you know, um, if you look at Andy Warhol, and Andy Warhol just took, you know, uh, you know, one picture and just, you know, puts it through the printer, uh, through blockchain actually, someone could say, wait a second, you took my original and reproduced it and I get now money out of it. Is this now kind of possible to kind of, that there are new forms of collaboration or new ways of tracing the original art piece in a way? What does it, what does, you know, happen out of that? It's like when you're talking, if you're talking about Warhol, it's like what he did with his wallpaper. Yeah. His wallpaper, he wanted to, everybody to have a wallpaper at the price of wallpaper. Now, if you want a one square meter of his wallpaper, you, just, <laughs> you know, you can't afford it. Um, I'm sure he's not very happy of that if he looks at what we're doing with his work, you know, so, yeah. The, at the end of the day, it's what Masha said. A lot of people look at it. It's not because we're using digital and that the, you know that you you can't remain honest. <laughs> you know, it's the you still have to, you know, it's like the the human huh? There's always human factor. Yeah. No, I mean, what remains is the question: What is the digital original? Because in the end, we have now digital processes to create and digital processes to multiply, and to uh, the not, let's say, to, to, to the general public, it looks the same. The file is the same in its nature. The printout is the same in its nature. So how do I secure a, a digital original? The certificate. Yeah. So um, for us, there is like um, two kind of differences. There is title versus copy, right? Like I mentioned before. So um, with the... Um, Securing the title of that, let's say, go back to this video art with five um, uh, editions. So if I transfer the rights, it's all about the rights. It's not about the copies. It's uh, which rights who has. So if I transfer the rights to you, I transfer the rights of a title to you, right? And then you have different copies spread around the internet. So this whole idea that you are losing control because you don't know where they go. So part of the vision when we also were building a scribe is, was um, to give, to empower the creators to see, okay, with the blockchain you can secure the provenance of title, right? Like. Uh, of the work. So how can you give and empower creators to have kind of control how their copies spread to give this provenance of copies? So we created another tool which was part of the, uh, is part of the vision is uh, called Where on the Net and uh, it is um, uh, basically you, it, it works with images, with photos or images, so you can uh, paste a URL of image URL and then you press go and it gives you provenance of copies, how they spread throughout the internet. So it's a search engine. It's like a search engine with analytics on top of it, right? And the technology exists for a long time, like what we've built, we've built analytics, uh, the, the value that we brought was analytics that you can actually see that, let's say, your uh, image started from... We did a couple interesting images uh, as an example, and like um, with logos of some companies, and the company said, oh, yeah, that's exactly when we put our logo online, and it was like, yeah, it was 2010, and you can see how the image started to spread from 2010, and now you have more than like, I don't know, 8,000 images and then you can di uh, dive deeper and see the URL where those images also um, are. So this helps you to have this uh, kind of idea of um, 
where the copies spread, right? So it gives you this control, uh, sense of control, because like a lot of artists that we talked uh, to, there's like, yeah, I want my image spreading all the internet, but I would love to know who is using it and where and how, right? So it was created towards uh, empowering the creator. I was also just wondering when we talk about, you know, um, with all these new te technologies, like the virtual reality, Uh, uh, world, I would say, um, um, especially with virtual world, what, what we see is that normally when we go into a gallery, when we go into a museum, art pieces are framed. So there's a, we're always a frame. And then suddenly, you know, within virtual reality, there's no frame anymore. There's no limit, actually. The, the space is like the canvas. And um, I was just wondering if we might also see kind of totally new forms of art actually coming up with uh, new forms of technology. That's for sure. Now to find out what, I don't have the answer. But mm -hmm. of course we will see. That's, that's the proper of an artist to take a space, whatever it's virtual or not, and do whatever he or she wants to do with it. So of course you will see things now in terms of uh, Again, it's not, either, it's not either or. I think it's two completely different experiences. You can be a fantastic art collector and have your own work at home. It still go in the digital world also. You know, it's not because it goes, it, it goes together. Now, digital in general for the for, uh, uh, public um, provides information also. It's also about information. And I think this is where digital is fantastic, is the information that it's providing you But it still doesn't give you all the information. You know, I, uh, I, I love this uh, concept that Tate came up with, which was to say uh, museums, or we museums, are giving you answers that Google can't. And it's true, you still have answers to questions that Google can't answer. Yeah. And this is what is fantastic, and you can get that only in the real world. Why, by talking to a real curator, talking to a real artist, or going to an exhibition, or listening to a, a talk. Why talks are so popular today? Because people still want the real thing, and we want even more. You know, you can, you know, how many, you have, you have uh, uh, places, you know, for example, I, don't, I do yoga, for example. You have all the course you want online, free, okay? Why do we still go to a yoga class? Mm -hmm. It's never the same. <laughs> you know, st so it's, this, it's exactly the, yeah. you, you will never have the, uh, yes, I can have everything for free. Yes, I can have access to digital. But still, there is thing that a teacher is going to tell me that, that I'm doing something wrong, you know, that I was not realizing, and, and so on and so forth. And it's like this for every domain. At the same time, I remember a conversation we had at some point about uh, your new venture, Econospaces, and the power it gives to curation and exhibition and how it becomes a time machine. Do you want to oh, talk yeah. about that a little bit? Because uh, then digital does have a new dimension and does offer new uh, possibilities of experiencing art. Yeah, but it's complementary. Um, I just have a, a son who came up with a nice... sing now? Sorry? <laughs> A son. a son. I have a song. I thought you started no, no, singing. No, no, no. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, I have a son who, who came up with a, a software um, which was done originally for the real estate. And it was this idea that for all of you who tried to either build or redo an apartment and had the help of um, an architect, um, there is always a moment where you're a bit frustrated because you see your space either in a maquette or you see it um, in a 3D environment, but you're not in it, so you're not living it. So you don't know if your kitchen table will fit the kitchen, really, you have to still do the, you know, so we all experience the IKEA kitchen thing, but uh, it's more or less that. But it's a, a bit more sophisticated because he pushed the, the thing that you can now put your VR glasses and you can experience. And suddenly I see him with a click of a mouse taking the painting of this wall and putting it on this wall and say, stop, what you've done here is what I would call the perfect curator's tool. Mm -hmm. Because as a curator of an exhibition, you face a problem, is that you might have the ideas in your head, 
you know exactly how you want to do the exhibition, but how are you going to talk to the people who are, in fact, hanging it, you know? This is one thing. And then you try to do it on the model, you try to do it in a 3D environment, and then you need the guy, anyhow, who is doing the model or doing, you know, the architect who's using AutoCAD. Still, you don't know if your exhibition really is perfect because it's only when you're going to hang that you say, okay, I said 148, it should be in fact 149, it will look better yeah. because you need to be facing it. Right. So basically, he did now transpose his real estate software for the art world. And so it is, we are calling it Iconospace because it's really about art and space. Mm -hmm. And it's this thing where you just take all your data which is already on your computer, click on your image, put it on the wall, with all the details you need for measurements and all this, I, I pass you all the details. But then I can send to the specific hangers, you know, the, the, the 2D as a PDF or the 3D as an experience. And you can go very far with this. We are having, fun, we are having new ideas every day with this. You know, we're having, uh, proposing the, 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 some museums to say, why don't you we rebuilt your two rooms where you always do your temporary exhibitions, we put 100 works in it, and now ask the public to play with it, you know, and do, say that to the public, do what you think should be done with these 100 works in these two rooms, and then why not doing it, you know? So you can now interact with the public. I was in a conference last week, and I heard Thomas Gerst, you know, the head of the art department for the BMW, who was telling to a crowd of museum directors, you should have a room in your building for the public to create and interact with the works of art. Mm -hmm. Who is going to have the courage to do that? Maybe not necessarily in the real life, yeah. why not? But at least virtually, we can do it. And there is nothing better to interact with your audience to know your audience, to find out what they want. This is just unlimited. You can do whatever you want. And like you were saying, my first reaction was to say, finally I'm going to be able to see the 1954 retrospective which was at the Heritage that we, I don't know, we read in a book yeah. uh, that we all talk about. It's always the reference, whatever it is, but we never saw it. Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot, we know to, uh, we come up with our references, but we never did experience. With this kind of tool now, everybody can relive, in fact, this experience. So it's a tool and it becomes an archive for the museums. You know, it, it helps everybody at the end of the day. Maybe before we open up the Q&A to the audience, a uh, final question. What idea uh, or what direction where the, where the art world is going to with the, 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 the digital shift, what is the most exciting idea what comes up to your mind, Marsha? Um, okay. <laughs> um, I, I really like technology and I'm very excited about it, but I think that technology is a tool. And um, artists are artists. They are the creative mind and it's just they're using different tools. So in terms of... Um, the artists, I think, I don't, I don't see, like, I don't know, we'll see what's going on, uh, but the tools are definitely are going to be much richer and different and, um, in terms of technology. But I also think that um, until uh, we get rid of this digital shell and art is just art and not digital art, but just any, regular art, just simply art, right? Just with digital, done with different digital tools, that's what probably will be the next steps. That's a vast question. <laughs> because um, I think honestly that in the time we are living today, in terms of, you know, terrorism, politics, fascism coming up right, left and center, um, it shows also that we are all lost of, um, of kind of values, of, um, of um, purpose. And, um, and I think in the museum world we know that um, there is a role here to be taken because artists are, at my opinion, the best to take the temperature 
of what's going on around us, and they translate it in their works. And politics know that, reason why they push them away, because they don't want the artists to interfere too much in their things, and we saw that also, unfortunately, in the past also. Um, but I think museums, they definitely have a role today to take, to not be, to, to stop being just the kind of mausoleum that they became, and that they have to take a social role and become a real, that it, it becomes a, a forum to talk. Um, the Tate is still, I'm sorry that I come back to the Tate, but I think it's one of the best examples in that respect. Um, they've been experimenting, they didn't succeed everything, but when Olafur Eliasson did his son, that was a fantastic example how the people took the space, mm -hmm. how they took the, it was theirs, it was not in the control of the museum directors and curators anymore. And I think curators are here now to, to, to dialogue directly and they should stop being in their office only and be in the space also. And, um, and it comes to also um, different types of art. We're going to shift probably in uh, more performing arts and, um, and every type of performing arts or mixing arts, you know, between music or fashion or whatever, theater, we already do it, mm -hmm. but it's going to become bigger and bigger. And um, yeah, what I am doing is still, it is a kind of digital mausoleum in the sense that we're just singing, but I, you need that at the beginning, and then you can go and have the real experience. So I think that this is where I can help for the beginning, but then it has to be a physical experience, experience that we will never kill. Great. Thank you, Marsha and Elizabeth, for this conversation. Great, let's take this as, as a basis for maybe the, the Q&A and uh, have a chance to open it up to the, to the audience. Are there any Excellent. questions? Thank you both for being Thank here. You. <laughs> Do we have a microphone in the audience? Not sure. Is, is Stein's name? You may have to speak up or come to the front. Yeah. So, any so, signs? Any questions? Yes. Could you? <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Uh, my name is uh, Connie Günther. I'm working for The Economist and I'm a journalist. And the last um, thing you mentioned about opening more space uh, to the audience, for instance, in museums, that museums should have a separate room, maybe where audience can play in a digital world, uh, play around a little bit and bring in the ideas. I think the, new, the news, newspapers, they did the same in opening up uh, blogs or having bloggers and having um, uh, uh, people to contribute and to say their opinion. But as we know, there's also a great deal of abuse of these platforms. You know, yeah, we hear about shitstorms. Aren't you afraid of that, the negative side that audiences, people would abuse that possibility and I would in a way digi digitally destroy art or damage art or write nasty things or, or just create bad things or just do we have to live with it, that there will always be a neg side, negative it, it side of people abusing it, it? It always did exist. It's not new. We always had, you know, crazy people coming and damaging a work of art. So that you will always have. Um, yeah. And that you can't, you can't, but you're totally right. I think this is exactly where the role of a curator is um, within the institution, which is to avoid these things by, by talking to people. Yeah, and just to add to it, like uh, museums, like especially I guess in Europe, are very hesitant to put images online, right? But if you think about it, when I talk, for example, to the daughter of my friend who is 16, she would never go to the museum without seeing 
which exhibition is there and which images are there. So she actually first goes through the Instagram, through all this, like, and then if she likes what she sees, she will go to the physical museum. So like the, the way we, like digital is a tool as well, and we shouldn't be afraid of it in that sense. And museums shouldn't be afraid of like putting their collection out there, uh, distributing it and giving access to, uh, users and uh, this knowledge that needs to be also kind of spread out. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, there is another, another example in terms of, not abuse, but um, how to use um, technology, I think, in a, in a bad way, so to say, or a stupid way, is that when you have an artist f making a work of art to fit an Instagram square, and you're having more and more of that, basically because they get more likes. Because if they put a rectangular work in a square, you're, of course, you know, it's smaller. And um, that's where, that's a lack of imagination, in my opinion, this is, this is the sad part. But that you can't avoid, you will always have these things. Hello, hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, there was a project I did which was called the Urban Nomad, and basically wanted to show the faces behind the images, because I always believe that art doesn't speak for itself. I believe that an emotional connection is kind of made between two people, and to understand the art, I need to have an emotional connection with the human behind the art. Um, and I just had a look on Icono TV, and I didn't know it before, and um, I was just thinking, why aren't spaces more of like a spot where I can get to know the artist and kind of see the face behind the art and hear his story. And by hearing his story, <coughs> I am allowed to kind of emotionally feel what he feels and therefore share the message. Because I always have the trouble of when you go to an exhibition, it kind of feels dead. There's just the walls and you You're have right. the, totally the right. painting and mm. it's kind of absurd because why would I go there to see an art that I could see online? You know, I would go there because I want an experience and the experience is made by humans. So I'm just wondering whether you kind of see things changing and maybe digital being a gateway kind of drug where you see the, the artist speaking about his art and then you maybe go to the gallery to see him speak live. Kind of the resurgence so, of, yeah. If you go on my website, <laughs> you will see that we launched um, the on-demand section, which is exactly that. The on-demand came with this idea that We've been very successful with our application because I didn't talk about the distribution, but that was my, my biggest um, aim was to really spread it on every single screen from your iPhone to your TV screen. And so I did originally traditional TV broadcasting with satellites, telecom boxes and all this. And now we're on every single smart TV. So if you have a smart TV, you can download our app. On, we are basically on all major brands. And we suddenly saw rocket. We never did any marketing yet. We're going to do it after the summer. Um, and it was just people discovering us by chance. So now we were wondering who are watching us. And then the question came by looking at the comments. And we could guess that most of them have never been in a museum, but they're just enjoying what they see. So then comes the next step. If they are liking what they are seeing, maybe there is a moment they are going to become curious and then want to know who is behind. So this is how came the idea of the on-demand, where we have three types of content. The first is our own films, just reorganized differently by playlist. You don't like contemporary, you want you know, Italian Renaissance, you will have your Italian Renaissance playlist. We are offering the same to contemporary video artists, where we're saying, why don't you try to show your videos with us and put it on the on-demand because it would be part of this royalty fee we're giving you back. And we, had, we have this month the extreme honor to, to play, so to say, with William Kentridge, which is, in my opinion, one of the best video artists we have because he's extremely social. It is about the people. You know, he's completely into politics. And on the same time, he does videos which can be look playful, and, but always treating a very deep um, uh, theme. So then you can look at this and say, that's cool, but who is this William Kentridge? 
So now on the playlist, you can discover also talks. So we have a, a project manager who is looking for all, as a curator, looking for all the best talks of all the people we're slowly putting. It's just brand new, so we're still getting there, but it's just to show you that it's exactly what we're trying to give now, is that if you want to know more, we're going to bring you on a silver plate all this information and, um, and try to give you the best information because it's the problem of the net. You have the worst like the best, so you have to, we as knowing what we're doing, or hopefully, uh, try to give you the, the best in that. So that's exactly, I hope I answered to that wish. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just thinking about um, the internet and uh, I feel like the way that it works a lot of times is there's an image and then someone else takes it and puts some text onto it and someone else takes it and animates it and it's kind of an evolutionary process and it becomes a meme and it becomes a GIF and, and do you think uh, blockchain technology can support or hinder that kind of like mass creative process that happens online? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, um, and there are some platforms that are getting built um, as we speak that will allow, like with blockchain technology, basically um, you can, exactly, you can track how the image was modified through and who are the authors. So you have or multiple ownership, right? Or you have uh, like, different models of that, like, and blockchain makes it uh, much easier to figure out who did what, to what point of time. But also think about it that, um, think about, like, I'm quite positive person in general and optimistic, so I believe that people want to do good. In general, it's not just not very easy for them to do. So, but think about a possibility that uh, with the right click, whenever you, uh, click on the image, you can actually have exactly who did that image, how to contact that person, right? And you can ask the permission or you have licensing right away. Like, so maybe this person did some Creative Commons licenses, right? Like, so you have very clear and transparent usage rights att and uh, attribution attached to every file that is on the internet, right? And um, that will help a lot even with the reusage, because a lot of artists, that's true, like you reuse some footage from another person and then you build on top of it and uh, so on, but sometimes you make angry some people, sometimes it's fine, but if you have clarity into what you can do with that image, that would be extremely useful. And again, you don't need digital to do that. It always it did exist and every single artist did that. They reappropriate a work and do whatever they want with it. That's the that's hard history for me. No, it's just in a digital ledger. Yeah. So I'll start with an example from music and then lead to a question. So you know, in YouTube, uh, every time a YouTube video is playing, say Michael Jackson Thriller, um, Google pays one eighth of a cent to the rights holder. Um, which doesn't lead to a lot of money for the artist. Um, so, you know, is, well, two questions. If, with music as an example, are artists getting properly compensated today? And fast forward 10 years to 2026, what is a model for music or for art or potential models where artists can feed their families? I don't know what would happen in 10 years. <laughs> um, it's already a problem for musicians, I think. Um, there is even a worse problem that I see coming in. It's not, nothing to do with digital, is that with all these TTIP things coming up with a copyright, mm -hmm. and artists are, musicians are dead scared about the fact that they might not even have their copyright protected properly. So this is nothing to do with a market space anymore. It's going to be with a, how do we protect um, an artist work um, in terms of the law and, and all these um, things. So it's a very big question, but um, again, um, 
at the end, the experience is the best. You know, it doesn't you. It's the it's the experience itself. And so, go to a concert and and go to the museum to our our show. I also think there will be probably like different uh, forms um, of that we will be seeing in the next probably couple years of, uh, and then we will see what sticks around and what uh, doesn't. Um, but also, um, if you think about digital, digital wants to be free, right? Like it's, um, you can't fight the physics of bits. It's digital file, like think, if we're talking about digital um, on, online. So um, how do you protect and how do you, uh, like some models are creating a scarcity with digital edition, blockchain, right? Uh, or there are different types of easy licensing, right? Like, or easy, um, I don't know, like exactly right-click licensing and you tip or tipping, right? Like we know Radiohead made more money from, uh, t mm. than they ever sold the albums from people tipping them, right? When yeah, but they... you need to be Radiohead. Yeah, it but doesn't there is work a lot if of I'm talent. Mr. X. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is a lot of talent out there, right? Mm. Different, definitely you need to be talented. So the mm. bar is much higher, right? So for the content as well, for the content creators as yeah, well. Thanks God, this will never be changed. You still need talent, that's true. That's true, <laughs> yeah. You still need to have talent to be compensated, right? Mm. But I think there will be different models uh, um, arriving and then we'll see the, the, the future will show us. Really, I mean, to, to add to that question, because you mentioned earlier Instagram and uh, they're the so-called influencers and influencer marketing is a new term that uh, is about. Who do you see as the new gatekeepers and tastemakers in the art world, or will it do without? <laughs> in this conference I was last week, there was, a, there was one person who came up with all the list of all these art influencers that we know by heart. And I find it very sad, I have to say, but um, there are some people who need that. And um, it's like people who are addicted in Facebook, they need to find out what's going on. So other people need to find out what these influencers are doing. This is, you know, this is, again, it's not only in digital that you have that. You have it everywhere. But going back to music, for example, a lot of talent was uh, discovered on YouTube. Right, so I think there will be some role to the public because. But then the it's the public; it's not individual influencers. No, no yeah, mm. yeah. I think it, it's it's not replacing anything. I think the gatekeepers will be still there, right? But it adds something on top of it, right? Like all of a sudden, the public has a voice and saying, "Ooh, that's really great artwork," right? And not just one critic that decides, like, uh, if you're lucky and he saw your work, because <laughs> normally it's a he. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I think there, because of digital um, um, tools like Instagram or Facebook that we all hate, uh, love to hate, but uh, it gives some kind of exposure, like how many galleries sell art through Instagram, right? And so it's, it's a tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, are there any more questions? Nope. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> the last one. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I've talked to some people recently who work at Arctonata and a few other digital marketplaces. Um, they have a big problem with what's happening behind the scenes of selling art, so especially the shipping part. Um, kind of feel that, um, I mean, digital art travels by bits, right? But physical art still needs to travel by a shipping provider. And usually it's quite a pain to either find it or work with them and so on. Do you see a need to revolutionize that kind of business to enable the digital kind of marketplaces to really flourish? Or do you think that's something that isn't as much a problem? I'm asking because I'm working in this field, but I'm just wondering what your opinion is. I think you would always have uh, original works that you would have to ship. No, I don't really see how you can do it like this. <laughs> um, but um... 
I think shipping, it's a logistics problem, yeah, right? Exactly. So it's like, doesn't matter if you ship art or if you ship diamonds or if you and ship insurance, uh, right? and insurance, there is insurance. So it's all kind of logistic problem where actually there are some companies right now that are applying blockchain to track that, right? Because you need to combine it with some kind of hardware as well because you need to kind of create this link so you can have, I don't know, uh, some IRDs or uh, other tracking systems that's combined, but it's logistics, definitely. And there are, I think there are some companies that are trying to address that. Okay, I think that's it. Perfect. Thanks again. Well, again, thank you so much. I mean, we've learned a lot from the elite to the democratization to art. There's a lot happening in, yeah. in, in the digital world. So uh, I think uh, check out both projects. Uh, look at Econo TV, uh, learn about Ascribe. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Andrea. Thank, thank you. you to you thank all. You. Thanks. Thank you.